in Jesus name and all the people said amen and amen give the Lord a great hand of praise today hallelujah turn to somebody and say look at me I'm anointed this morning hallelujah give them an embrace and let them know you love them this morning bless them thank them the person then take you on find somebody who will the person didn't appreciate you find somebody who will hallelujah the Lord bless you real good you may be seated glory to God and a pleasant good morning to all of you and greetings in the wonderful name of our precious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ I welcome you into the house of the Lord today. This is the day that the Lord had made. And this is the day that we're going to worship Him. We count it a privilege to be in God's presence, to honor and to worship Him. And I'm glad that you're here today. Good to see all of you in God's presence. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is a brand new week. And it's a special week for all Christians. <clears throat> and uh, we want to acknowledge the purpose the purpose of all the celebrations and all the anxiety, we understand the purpose and we know why we do what we're doing this morning. Hallelujah. You look wonderful today. You look refreshed, restored, renewed, rejuvenated. You look wonderful. You look like you're ready for the word today. And I think I'm ready to give it to you. Praise the Lord. We thank God for a glorious week. We thank God for a week that was full how many of you appreciate the strength that God gave you for this past week? And, you know, the grace that was upon your life that kept you every day, 24-7. And the ability and strength to endure all the challenges you had to face. For those who had to go through their grief, those who had to go through their battles, those who had to go through their mental pressure, family tension, those who had, who had to go through everything and anything that affects the human life negatively. That is not nice. But thank God for His grace that is sufficient. And His strength is made perfect in time of weakness. In sickness, he's there. In trouble, he's your stay. In worry, he's the joy, all of joy. Whatever you are going through, he says, I am that I am. I am with you. And this is the confidence and consolation we have. Sunday school is dismissed at this time. And the children can go to their classes. And those of you joining with us this morning, we want to welcome you to our Sunday morning worship service right here at Forest Park in Trinidad. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. We trust that this ministry is being a blessing to you. And today is no exception. The Lord has a word for you. Stay tuned. God bless you. We love you. And be ready to receive from the Lord. Let's put our hands together and welcome our national and international audience. God bless you, wherever you are. Amen. Now, how many of you are ready for the word this morning? We have a very exciting week coming up. It's going to be Easter weekend next. <clears throat> and uh, lots of activities. <clears throat> And uh, next month is going to be a very special month also. Anybody here this morning? Yeah. Okay. Turn to somebody and said, smile like my pastor this morning. No, you did not. You can see my teeth. Okay. <clears throat> Tell somebody, say, God has a blessing for you today. And uh, say to them that you are going to see your problems and handle them differently from today. 
In fact, say, you're going to handle me differently. You know why? Because our great Lord and Savior Jesus came and he gave us an example. He gave us an example. Today, the world all over is celebrating uh, Palm Sunday. And I appreciate when people can uh, below the tradition of consciousness celebrate it and not even know. Come, sister, come. Come, yes, you. Don't be scared. Come. Just come, come just as you are. Come. Just stand here. I want everybody to see you. She's celebrating Palm Sunday. <laughs> Give her a hand. Come on. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> Can you see that? You know, and uh, you just walk on the breeze while do the waving, okay? <laughs> Praise the Lord. The world all over is celebrating Palm Sunday, and three quarters of the world don't even know what they're celebrating. They're just waving branches. In some churches today, they're waving branches, and the priest is walking and throwing flowers, like if he's getting married or something. They don't understand the significance, but I want to help you today. <laughs> I want to talk about Jesus' final week. And we'll conclude this next Sunday morning through Friday, Wednesday, Friday. We'll be talking about this final week and what the Lord went through. Been through. But Jesus' final week on the earth, uh, before his crucifixion, rather, and some of tes the testings and trials he'd been through. But three things noted there. He was rejected. He was tried and crucified. Given us an example of some of the suffering we are going to experience and trials we're going to experience as a result of what he had been through. But he did it to set us free. In Daniel chapter 9, I just want to recap your mind, recap your memory and take you back a little bit. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, 26, uh, we are told that Daniel had a, a prophecy concerning the end times. And God gave him that prophecy in the form of 70 weeks. That 70 weeks give us a detailed explanation of what will transpire and culminate the end of the age. Beginning from the time the command was given to Nehemiah to go and rebuild the temple till the time the Messiah be cut off, which was the crucifixion, and the time of the end, end of the tribulation. But between the Messiah being cut off and the time of the tribulation, is, called, is the church age in which we are living in right now. So the final week of those 70 weeks, the final week is yet to be fulfilled. That week is a week of years, seven years. Okay? And we know that 69 weeks have been fulfilled. 49 for the temple and 62 till Jesus, the Messiah was cut off. So plus 7, that's six, 69. And we know the 70th week is yet to be fulfilled. So the, from the 69th, to the 70th week, the space between that is called the church age. That's where we are now. If all the 69 weeks were fulfilled, which is 483 years, that's 69 by 7, then what makes people feel that the next seven years would not? So we are living in the time between the 69th and the 70th week. <clears throat> and it says, Know ye therefore, from verse 25, Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, unto the Messiah, that's Jesus Christ, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Seven weeks, three score and two weeks. The streets shall be built again and the walls, even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. That word cut off means death. Shall be put to death. But not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That happens in AD 70. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Desolations are determined. Now, Daniel indicated that the Messiah would be cut off. This portion of Daniel's prophecy was fulfilled precisely 483 years uh, later when Jesus, when Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday riding on a donkey and the people were uh, 
praising and worshiping and were gladly receiving him. People who knew who he was and knew that he was the Messiah were gladly receiving him and waving their plant, palm branches on, on, on Palm Sunday, which, we, which is today in, in, in celebration. But today, people don't understand what transpired. Now, that significant entry into Jerusalem fulfilled prophecy precisely as Daniel uh, predicted. With precision, it was fulfilled. And in John chapter 12, if you will go to John chapter 12, you will see where Jesus entered into Jerusalem and that prophecy was fulfilled on, in verse 12. It says, on the next day, most people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth and meet him and cried, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is the king of Israel. Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king or your king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. Your king cometh riding on a donkey. And that's exactly what happened to Jesus when he was walking when he was riding into Jerusalem. And people were shouting and screaming and celebrating and praising him and waving the branches. Can you picture that in your mind? How many of you appreciate Jesus coming to this world? All the praises belong to him. And you know what? Would, would it, it would be very interesting if that donkey thought all the praises was for him. But the king was sitting on the donkey. And the people were worshiping, praising him. But I sure the donkey felt good. It felt good. We carry the king. We are carrying the king. It feels good to carry the king and everybody worshiping the king that you are carrying. Amen? All right. Now, here is the thing. I don't want to dwell too much on that. But I want to give you a few lessons this morning. That was the start of Jesus' final week before the crucifixion. It was the most trying week any human being could ever go through. The most trying week in Jesus' life. A very, very painful one. The lessons of the fiery trial that he'd been through. But before I go into that in details, go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And... Uh, I want to just get your mind, get your mind on, on, on the fact that we all are facing our fiery trials as a result of being Christians or it could be just being a human being. But because there is a real devil that is, that is out there. Okay? And uh, we see every step of Jesus' last week provided us a lesson for our lives. After Gethsemane came the trial. The way in which Jesus ended the trial is a lesson to all of us. A lesson in how to endure the mockery, how to endure the attacks and persecution of the world. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 7. You found it? It says the trial, that the trial of your faith being more precious than of gold that perisheth. Now, keep that in the back of your mind. And can you imagine Jesus had that on his mind? Look up here for a minute. Jesus was about to go through a week of trying times. Trial. And can you imagine him thinking just what we are reading here right now? The trial of your faith being more precious than of gold that perish it, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So I'm sure, I'm certain that in spite of him knowing what he had to face, yet the Bible tells us that there, were, there was a joy in his heart to do what he was doing, even though it was painful, even though... His, his own will 
in his own mind, he didn't want to. He asked the father to take this cup from him. But yet, he said, not my will, but the, thy will be done. In himself, it was not easy for him to go through that. But yet, he was willing to obey the father's will. And picture yourself going through what you're facing right now. In your, in your mind, you do, not, you do not want to really be involved in anything that makes you feel uncomfortable. But because you know that you want to please God, you will endure it. You will endure it. Amen? And Peter here is writing about fiery testings. He's wanting to read about the story of Jesus, but I want to bring it practically into your life. You see, Peter wrote about his trial and he spoke about how Jesus faced his trial with faith. Say faith. Faith is knowing something. Faith is knowing that something is going to work out. So he faced his trial with faith. He faced his trial with faith, poise, and forgiveness. First Peter chapter 2, verse 19. Look at verse 19. Let's walk through very quickly. Hmm? For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is, is it if when we be buffeted for your faults, that you take it patiently? But if when you do well, listen to this church, if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. So Jesus took his suffering patiently because he knew it was acceptable because he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Can you see God being pleased when you take your suffering and face it patiently? Can you see God being pleased with that? But when you retaliate and you jump in the flesh to get even and take out vengeance on somebody who put that pressure on you, you nullify the blessings and the purpose and make a mess of everything. Are you there with me? Verse 21. <clears throat> Verse 21 says, For even here unto you were called, were you called, because Christ also, say that word also, Christ also suffers. So you were called to suffer. Christ also suffered for us, leaving us a what? Leaving us a what? <clears throat> now, the, pro the, the question is, are you willing to follow his example? Do you follow his example or do you, do you lean on your own understanding? Are we having church this morning? See? It's the problem is when you follow and lead your own, lean on your own ex understanding. That's when we have problems. Watch this. For us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Follow what? His steps. Follow his examples. And verse 23, who, when he was reviled, he beat them up. That's what he did. When he was reviled, what he did? Come on, man, you have it in front of you, read it out. What? He reviled, <clears throat> not again. When he suffered, what? <clears throat> Threatened not. You talk about following his, his examples, right? But committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. You see, God will vindicate your cause. Vengeance is mine. Don't take matters in your own hands. Be at peace and allow wrath. You know what the Bible says? Paul says, allow wrath. In other words, allow people to get mad at you. It's okay. They get mad at you, that's all right. You be at peace with God and commit yourself to him because he is the one who judges righteously. Are we there? Verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on a tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. Look, talk about blessings. 
For you were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your soul. You are under the shepherding of Christ. You are under the leadership. He is your bishop. The bishop of your souls. Hallelujah. So we must follow his examples. And exhibit the nature of Jesus when called to face any hardship, any difficulties, committed into the hands of the Lord. Who always judge fairly. Verse 23. Always judge fairly. I like that. That's where you get your consolation. Now let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 1. Look at the fiery trials. Our fiery trials. Now, let me ask the question. How many of you have problems here? How many of you don't, you, 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 you don't have problems? Let me see. If you don't have problems, I want to know how come you don't have problems. You have to be living in an island by yourself, in a garden of Eden, where there's, everything is perfect, for you not to have any problem. And maybe you still have a problem. If you're living there all by yourself, the Bible says it's not good for you to be alone. Now, your fiery trial may be in your family relationship. Most people today have problems. Their biggest problem, and read my lips, is based on relationship. Your biggest problem, relationship. It's relational. Now, look at chapter 3. Likewise, you wives. Uh-oh. Be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also without a word, or without the word, say without the word. All the ladies say, all the ladies say, without a word. Say, without speaking. Amen. They also may, without the word, be won by the conversation. The word conversation is conduct. No, conduct. The conduct of the wives. Your fiery trial may be in your family relationship. Notice it started here with husbands and wives because all the problems in the home begins right there with the marriage. Then goes to the children and the family. Then the community and the police have to handle it. So, you may have to deal with an intolerant behavior, unbelieving spouse, a rebellious child. How many have rebellious children? Don't say amen. You may not like you if they're here. Rebellious child. Or a difficult relative like a brother or a sister. Or aunt or nephew or uncle. It may involve a person who says unkind things about you. Anybody ever had anybody said any, anything unkind about you? Look at verse 9. Not rendering evil for evil. Nor railing for railing but contrawise blessings. Knowing that you are there unto call that you should inherit a blessing you see people say unkind things about you but you know who you are you do not have to respond by saying unkind things to them how many of you have ever been insulted here hmm? people insult one another and don't even know they're insulting and you wonder why people retract why people retreat from you? Because you say things that are insulting. You think you're saying something very, very profound. <clears throat> but you have to think. Say think. Now, it may be a person who interrogates you about your Christian life or, <clears throat> or, your, um, or you being a Christian or your Christian life. You know, they, they, they tell you things because you're a Christian. Everybody, anybody ever be persecuted because you're a Christian? Hmm? Look at verse 15. 
But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. With what? We seem to leave out that word in our conversation. The understanding of meekness and fear. The fiery trial separates the saints from the ain'ts. It separates the real from the phony. The call out one from those who are just hanging around. Your fiery trial is what makes you. Church, you know a Christian. You know a Christian by the quality life they display when they go through their problems. That's how you know a Christian. Not somebody who, who jump around and shout and lick down a few benches and shout and sweat and say hallelujah and shout all the place and get goosebumps and go up there and want to knock you down. No. But when they face their trial, you can see, you, when they face their testing and they face their problem, they have a place called the secret place where they go and feel comforted and rejuvenated and re, re, revitalize their spirit. And they come out there with a glow, with, with a fervency because they know that God heard them and so they can walk and be strong because they know their God. We have to live a life declaring who we serve. Let people know we are serving a God who cares for us, who is watching over us, who is in control of everything, and He wants us to sanctify ourselves and handle our situations with meekness. So there'll be no conflict. There should be absolutely no conflict between us. We may have, we may have to face challenges, but we should not have conflicts to the place where it is bringing us down and getting, getting us off track. So facing a trial of your faith and character will force you to decide how much you really want to do the will of God. How much you really want to do the will of God. Now, now look at uh, chapter 2, chapter 2 verse 15. Chapter 2 verse 15. For so is the will of God. For so is the will of God that with well doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men i always tell people when they mess you up you stay in the will of god and prove them wrong because of the ignorance when people do not understand what you understand and when they, when they, when they don't know what you know you who you who know you should walk Above their ignorance. This is what it says. By doing good. By doing good. That with well doing you may put to silence the ignorance. The lack of understanding. Their foolishness. Their wickedness. You'll put it away. Hallelujah. I alone said hallelujah. Now look at First Peter chapter 4. Now Peter is talking about fiery trials, and I'm just picking a few verses here to make a point, a few points. You'll be stronger when it is over because of your resolve to never go back to the world system of vindication. If you follow the world system of vindication, you'll want to get even with everybody who messes around with you. Starting with husband, wife, children, two bad guys. Mess with me. You tell me something, I will tell you something back. You know, a plaster for every soul, word for word, argument for argument. And we have this going on in the family circle. Jesus came riding on a donkey on Palm Sunday to show us how to live, how to overcome this thing by his suffering. Palm Sunday is not for you to go and just put, do some ritual celebration and go back home and fight with one another. Understand why Jesus came, what his purpose was, what he'd been through, and he left us an example to face our trials. Whatever you do, please, please don't get bitter. When you're going through persecution, when people do you hurtful things, you feel hurt, but don't ever get bitter. That's the worst thing you can do. Because that is the 
That's, the, the, that's Satan's resource. He will use that to destroy you, destroy your mind. And your soul will become bitter. Your words, bitter. Your attitude, bitter. Mm. You don't want that. First Peter chapter 4. For as much then as, as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with knives and... No, no. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. That's your weapon. An armed mind of Christ is your weapon to deal with that thing. In your house. Arm yourself with the same mind. I like that. For he that had suffered in the flesh had ceased from sin because your bitterness will cause you to sin. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Folks, we endure what we endure because of the will of God. We go through what we go through. We go through the insult and we feel like belittled. People disrespect you. Children disrespect you. As a pastor, I feel disrespected in many, many areas. But you go through these things and maintain yourself in the will of God. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? You see the wildness and you see how people behave in your presence, not realizing you are the pastor and yet they show you disrespect. You go through what you go through as a husband, as a wife, as a child, as a, as a son, as a daughter. Whatever you go through in your, on your job, your co-workers, people disrespect you. They know you're a Christian and they're showing you they can do things to upset you. To get you angry, to see how you're going to react. Just want to, they want to give you something to react and then use what they give you to destroy you. Hmm? Now watch this. <clears throat> First Peter 1, 12. First Peter 1, 12. I'm going to have to move fast, faster. <clears throat> you have verse 12 in your Bible? I'm glad you do. We should take pleasure when we are insulted for Christ's sake. When you're insulted for being a Christian, take it with joy. Verse 12 says, Unto whom it was revealed, not unto themselves, but unto us, that they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. In other words, look what it says. The, the, our reward for enduring insults for Christ's sake will be greater because the Spirit of God will come upon you with a, in a greater capacity when you endure. This is what happened to Jesus when he endured that week of suffering. The anointing of God was upon him, church, and gave him the grace to endure. And you have to see yourself on the anointing, enduring your, your trials. We should praise God for the privilege of being identified in Christ's suffering. Praise God. Thank God I can suffer for Christ. Knowing what he's been through, I can suffer for his name's sake because I know if I suffer for him now, I shall reign with him then. Amen. Glory to God. Amen? Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5. Now the Bible talks about the roaring lion. Did everybody, anybody, any, any one of you have a roaring lion in your life? Is there a roaring lion? I'm not talking about your husband and no. all. Is there a roaring lion in your life? Hmm? You, you don't have one? But the trim, you have a roaring lion in your life? Every single one of you need to realize you have a roaring lion in your life. Okay? Okay? Don't go home now and say to your wife, you're a roaring lion. No, no. In 1 Peter chapter 5, <clears throat> from verse 6, it says, Humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God that you may that he may be he may exalt you in due season. 
and you see those little two dots there? Hmm? In due season, you'll, in due time, it means by way of. By way of. Now, by way of what? Next verse. Casting all your care upon him for he cared for you. All your care, whatever you desire when you go through your problems. What do you desire? You want to come out of it? You want to overcome it? You want to be victorious? You want to, want to, want to deal with that issue and, be, and, and be, 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 be an overcomer? You cast all your cares before him. Now watch this. He said, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Seeking whom he may devour. That's the thing there. Now, next verse. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same affliction, say, say it after me, same affliction, are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Same affliction. But the God of all grace who had called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after he has suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. That's the end result of it. How many of you want that? How many of you want that? Are you afraid to answer something? How many of you want that? No, 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 no. I, I hate to see people live a defeated life. After they hear... After they are hearing what God is saying to them to be victorious. You go right out and live a defeated life. Pay attention. Don't sleep. Okay? Now watch this. The enemy is the one who brings fiery trial. Okay? The enemy brings fiery trial. He is a persistent devil. He's very persistent. You had dealings with him last month? You think that's the end of it? No, he's coming back again this month. You dealt with an event last month, it will come again. It will come again and again. When one is over, another one. But we are overcomers. See, we're always going to face problems. What he wants to do? He wants to put you in a crisis of conflict. A crisis of conflict with your boss, your finances, your management of your life, your family, your home, your brother, your sister, your, your husband, your wife. People in the church, your, your neighborhood, anybody he can find, he wants to bring you into a crisis of conflict. Understand that. We are living in two worlds. The physical world and the spiritual world. We are more spiritual beings than we are physical beings. And therefore, we must be spiritually minded more than we are carnally minded. Now, he wants to put you in a valley of decisions where you have to decide whether or not you really want to follow the examples of Jesus or give up. When you give up, you start cussing and fussing and fighting, and then you have to go before the mirror and say, I know I messed up. Then you come to church, you feel convicted. You feel heavy. You feel burdened because your attitude was not nice. Your attitude went, send the wrong message, wrong signal to those around you. Your children heard you. Uh, people on the job, wherever you are, and they see your behavior, they hear what you said, they heard you on the phone, whatever it is, your attitude tells. That's what Satan wants. That's what Satan wants. But humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Church, understand this this morning. We have to. We have to because conflicts will come. Pressure will, crushing pressures will come. Disturbances will come. Family feud will happen. Life will happen. Things are going to happen in your life every day. But how poised are you? How ready are you to love God and to forgive others and to stand strong knowing who you are and be confident in your faith and focus on your destiny and live consequent to receive that destiny? See? Life is not just about get up in the morning, go to work, come back, go buy grocery, come back, go eat KFC, come back, go to work. Get up, go buy KFC, go to work, go to the beach, come back. Life is not about that. You have tasted all of that and still not satisfied. You have eaten all the KFC until it's sold out. No bread, no, 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 no biscuit, no, 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 no spicy. The tray empty. And you're still not satisfied. You start, keep going back there over and over. The same problems are occurring every day in life. You have to go to work every day. Last week, you have to go work again next week. 
and there's a consistent, consistent operation in this daily life. And still we, we are not satisfied, we are not happy, we are still not content, we are always facing struggles day after day, when it will over, one of these days you're hoping, you're hoping, hoping, and things are not changing for the better. We have to learn to live through these things. We have to learn to live through these things and focus on the most important things that are not temporal but are eternal. And understand Satan's job is to bring you to a place where he gets you into a crisis to destroy you. His ultimate goal is to destroy your good intention. To fight for your destiny, contend for the faith and live a victorious life. Whatever he can ploy against you, he will try. So my encouragement to you is to remember he wants to put you in a valley of decision where you have to decide whether you will follow Christ or let me, let me deal with this thing the way I see it. That's his intention. The Bible tells us that Satan forced all of Jesus' disciples. He forced them to have a fiery trial. Just as he did with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Physically, he's doing it with us spiritually. He forced every one of his disciples. Do you know every single one of Jesus' disciples had to go through a fiery test to the point of death? He forced them into it. He brings a trial. He brings a trial, but guess what? God turns it around and uses it. Hallelujah. That's what he does. So everything you are faced with, can you convert it and say, listen, can, how can God use this thing? How can I allow God to use this for my own good? Can you use it for your own good? Not to justify yourself, you know, but to use it the way God wants you to use it so he can get the glory. After you have endured the fiery trial, the Bible says God will restore. He will support. He will strengthen and place you on a firm foundation. Verse 10. Hmm? After you have endured, and the God of all grace who had called you unto his eternal glory by Christ. After. Say after. Say after that. See, after that, tell somebody, say, see, this thing I'm going through, after this, say, after this, there is going to be an after this. Somebody fighting you, putting pressure on you, frustrating you, attacking you, persecuting you, give them the rope, let them run, let them run, let them run, 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 run. There's going to come an after this, after this. Then what? Let them go. Uh, it's only for a time. It's only for a season. It's only for a time, church. Everything you go through is only for a time. From pleasure to persecution. Everything is for a time. Now, <clears throat> let's go and look at Jesus for a moment. Let's go to Luke chapter 22. The fiery trials. In your fiery trials, follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. The fiery trials of Jesus is something that we need to, to focus on. Now, Luke chapter 22. How many found it? Verse 31. The first thing Jesus experienced was a trial of abandonment. See, abandonment. Abandonment. Verse 31 tells us, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan, had, Satan asked to have you, that he may what? Sift you as wheat. Right? Jesus made, made that, that statement. Satan desire to have it in a sift like we. Jesus knew that Satan would test his disciples, you know. He knew it. Peter was especially secured in himself. Very secured in himself to the point where he felt like nothing could ever move him from his position. Look up here. I have news for you. Don't be too overconfident in yourself. Because in yourself, you can't do a thing. And Peter was very, very self-confident. Okay? Your confidence is in Christ. Understand that. Now, 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 look at verse 33. Verse 33 in that same passage. Verse 33. You there? Look what Peter said. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. Nobody can stop me. Lord, I'll die for you. 
<laughs> he thought so. He thought so. He was secure of himself. But Jesus knew the outcome of Peter's trial. That the outcome of Peter's trial will change his attitude. And yet, even though Jesus knew it, he still loved him and accepted him. Imagine he didn't do it yet. Jesus knew he was going to do it. What he was going to do, betray him, right? He said, Satan desired to sift you, to have you like me, sift you as weak. I know. You say you're going you're gonna to go with me all the way till I die. I know. And Jesus knew all of that. He will fail. He will fail. Jesus knew all of that. And yet Jesus loved him. And he what? Accepted him. Now that is something for us to take either. He knows the weakness and the weak areas of your character and will allow you to undergo testing in those areas. So watch this. Peter's, Peter failed the test. Now notice in that verse it says, Satan desire to have you, let me see you as weak, but I have prayed for thee, the next verse, verse 32, that I pray for thee that thy faith faileth not. Now notice, Peter failed. He failed. Even though, even though he, 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 he failed. Jesus didn't pray that he, he failed. He failed not. He prayed that he, his faith failed not. How many of you have failed here? But your faith stands. Your faith stands the test. And when thou art converted, when he is signifying that there's a set appointed time, there's a, there's a, there's, there's a after this, there's an after this, Peter, you're going you, 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 you're gonna to fail, you're going to deny me, you have confidence in the cell, but I know before the cock crow, you'll deny me, Peter. But after that, after all of that, there's an after this, I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you that your faith will fail not. That faith will rise again. There's an after this. Hallelujah. That keeps us going. So the moment he failed, and you know he failed, right? The moment Peter failed, the Bible tells us, he looked in the window and caught the eyes of the Lord. Now, he said, I wasn't going to deny, you know, you, well, you know the story, right? I'm not going through the whole story. Jesus said, I pray that your faith fail not. He said, sit and desire. Peter said, Lord, whatever happened, I will not leave you. I will not forsake. I'll go all the way to, to, to death. And we know Peter denied the Lord three times after that. And when he denied the Lord and the cock crew, guess what? First thing Peter, he looked at Jesus and he saw through the windows of his eyes. And he saw. You see, what I'm trying to show you here is that we say so much we're going to do. Lord, I bless you. Lord, I praise you. Lord, I worship you. Lord, I endure. Lord, I give you glory. I give you praise. I give you glory. I give you praise. And when you are in a trial and he wants the glory, you're not giving it to him. When, he go, when you're going through your problem and he wants your glory, he, you're not giving him. Lord, I praise you. When you're going through your trial and he wants your praise, you're not giving him. But when you're in church... I praise you, Lord. I worship you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Just like Peter. Don't get vexed with me. I listen to you. I watch you. I have to deal with you. I have to counsel you. God wants your praise. You see, the best praise you can give God is when you're going through your Mary clay, when you're down in the pit, in the valley, in the wilderness, and you can praise God out of it. Glory to God. That's the praise God wants. Now watch this, church. We see here, Peter abandoned the Lord. So he felt abandoned. And verse 61, look at verse 61. Everybody with me? And the Lord turned and looked. Well, if you notice, Peter, you know, three times before that, Peter denied the Lord. <clears throat> verse 61. And the Lord turned and looked at, upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crew, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter looked. Can you imagine how Peter felt? The Lord, folks, the Lord is observing the way you react in your fiery testing. The Lord is observing because the Lord was watching Peter's reaction. You know what, Peter, what was Peter's reaction? If you back up, you'll see in, 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 in verse 55. The Bible tells us Peter sat down among them and a certain maid beheld him, sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, this man was also with him and he denied that. He denied, saying, woman, I know not this man. Hmm? Then again, about a space of an hour, 
another word, after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also, thou art, thou art also with them. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know not. He goes up and said, Man, I am not. I am not with them. And then again in verse 59, about a space of an hour after, another confident, confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, immediately was cock a doodle doo. The cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. God is observing you how you react when you face your persecution, your trials, your temptation, your problem, whatever it is, God is watching you. That is when he either gets the glory or you put him down. Amen? Isn't that true? All right. Now, 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 now let's go a little further. Then Peter realized what has happened. He realized, he realized, and this is what Jesus prayed about, that your faith failed not. He realized that the Bible said he wept, he cried bitterly. Bitterly, he cried bitterly. Look at verse uh, 62. Hmm? And Peter went on, went out and wept bitterly. Bitterly, that's conviction. Say conviction. So, so he truly repented of his sins, opposed as opposed to Judas, who simply felt remorse. So here Peter denied the Lord, and he repented of his sin. Judas betrayed the Lord and just showed remorse. Throw on the money, get upset, get mad, but he did not repent. He did not repent. Okay? Judas didn't repent. So you see the difference? The bottom line was that all Jesus' disciples abandoned him and left him. Every single one of them. Have you felt abandoned at times? Hmm? I do. Have you felt abandoned at times? Especially by your family and your loved ones. You feel like you're all alone. You feel like an orange stuck on a pin. You're the only one in the world. Hmm? Am I talking to human beings here? You feel abandoned by the people you cared so much. Abandoned by the people you love so much and are close to. Daniel felt abandoned in, the, abandoned in the lion's den. Jeremiah felt abandoned in the cisterns. Elijah felt abandoned in the desert. Joseph felt abandoned in the pit. We, when we go through our abandonment, when we go through our sufferings, you must remember our brethren who suffered the same affliction. We, we were told that by Peter, didn't we? Hmm? we? Remember them. Let me encourage you. They all experienced the feeling of abandonment. Will you continue to serve the Lord even though those you depend upon turn their backs on you? Will you continue to serve the Lord even though they turn their backs on you? Look at Jesus. All of them abandoned the Lord. And guess what? He kept on moving towards Calvary. It didn't stop him from pursuing the cross. He didn't stop him from going through his suffering. He continued. He didn't stop. Even though there were nobody around. Imagine you're going to be killed and... All those who was, you sat with, you ate with, you had great time of fellowship together, strengthening them, preaching to them, teaching them, and now you're going, they're going to kill you. Are you looking for them and you can't find them? All in hide. Hmm? Sometimes people, when, when you need people the most, they're not there for you. Isn't that true? Hmm? Not only the trial of abandonment, also you have to face the trial of mockery. Chapter 22, verse 63. Look at verse 63. And the men that held, held Jesus mocked him and smote him. Anybody ever been mocked here? Hmm? Mocked him and smote him. More direct than abandonment is mockery. An attack against your faith and character. So what your term or understanding of mockery is different from what I'm talking about. You know? Mockery is when people provoke your character. Provoke your integrity. Hmm? Mock you as a Christian. Huh? When people say things about you, let me tell you something, there are people there that are just waiting for you to slip, you know. They're watching you. The moment you slip, boy, they nail you to the cross. They drop it on you because, you see, I don't know what is the expectation of Christ. They expect so much from Christianity but nothing from themselves. And the moment you make a mistake, and I'm coming to tell you, you will make mistakes. But Jesus said, I have prayed that your faith fail not. Peter, you will fail, but your faith must not fail. 
Because after this, mm -hmm. after this, Peter, you who do not want to be identified with me will be ready to die for me. You will. And not only be crucified, but crucified upside down. See, it says after this. And I'm telling you, church, remain faithful. When mocked or attacked, when your faith is under testing, when you're going through your, your character is under attack, the gods, the Bible tells the gods mocked Jesus' prophetic gift. In that verse, you see, they mocked his prophetic gift. Look at verse 64. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smoked thee? You know what they were doing? They were mocking his prophetic gift. Prophesy. You know prophecy? Prophesy. You know who hit you? I'm sure, I'm sure if Jesus had said, Your name is Albert Trim. Just imagine Albert Trim was there. If Jesus had called out that fellow's name, he might have dropped dead. Huh? Because he was blindfolded. But you see, the Lord loved him still. He wanted him to die. But God didn't do that. He didn't do that. They blindfold him, demand that he say which of them has struck him. You see, the world today makes a mockery of anything concerning Jesus. He says, Jesus, and they're ready to mock you. The religious, other religions will mock you. And, 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 and don't, I mean, people who uh, want to live a worldly life, they'll mock you. Anybody who disagrees with Christianity will mock you and attack you and make you feel very uncomfortable in your presence and make you feel like what you have is not going to fit in in the culture of the world and make you feel like a misfit in society. So therefore, you feel like abandoning Jesus too. No, 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 friend. Stand up and stand out for Jesus Christ. Stand up for Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed to declare to your family that you love Jesus. Don't be afraid to stand up to your family and say, you know what? I am a Christian. I'm going to act like a Christian. I'm going to deal, I'm deal with this issue like a Christian. I'm going to stand up as a Christian. I don't care what people think about me. I know who I am. Stand up for your Christian faith, church. You stand for Jesus. Now you stand up for you. Hallelujah. Amen. So he's mocked. You know, I, I like how Jesus handled it. Even though the world today makes a mockery of him, you know, and will make a mockery of you, any kind of Christian. You know, Christians are the most vulnerable people to mockings. We are most vulnerable. They don't mock Muslims. They don't mock Hindus. They always mock Christians. Why? Christians and Jews always mock them. Hmm? Why? Because this, the devil don't like the truth. The devil don't like the truth. A kingdom divided against itself will not stand. So the devil is not fighting himself. He's just fighting us because we are not of him. We are of him. That alone is proof that we are, in, we are standing on the foundation of truth. By serving Jesus Christ and being persecuted for him, it proves that we are standing on true, the true foundation. Judaism and Christianity, the only true foundation. Glory to God. Hallelujah. All others are false. Lies have truth and in the end those. Let me tell you something, church. We all, let me give you a truth. A truth many one yet needs to learn. Many people need to learn. Number one, we all crave. We all crave acceptance. Isn't that true? We all crave acceptance. Is there anybody who, who don't like to be accepted? In your home, in your marriage, in your family, in your church, in your, on your job. You all crave acceptance. But can we endure rejection? Can we endure rejection? We want to accept, but can we endure rejection? See? Jesus, God said, you're my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. He was accepted with the Father. And you know what? He, knowing the Father accepted him, was able to face rejection. You could go ahead and reject me. It's okay. My father has already received me. If you know you're under the mighty hand of God, you don't care whether the president honor you, the prime minister recognize you, or somebody recognize you. It doesn't matter to you. It doesn't matter what they think about you, what they feel about you, what they give to you or not. You know who already blessed you and set aside you and established you and have given you a foundation. It doesn't matter. 
That's our position. So we crave nothing in this world. Whether you accept me or not, it don't matter. I am already accepted in the beloved and I'm seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. As he is, so are we. Jesus was mocked and he was struck, but he did not retaliate. The true also 